Hello, and welcome to the Tom's Hardware Show. I'm your host, Sharon Harding, and today we're looking at Asus's new 2-in-1 with an interesting twist and how Hitman 3 performs on different graphics cards. So let's kick things off live. So as always, we're live and taking questions from the audience. So if you have anything you'd like to ask, just drop your question into the chat on Facebook or YouTube, and we'll try to answer it live on air. So this week, joining me is a pair of Tom's Hardware senior editors, Jared Walton, our graphics uh, expert slash editor. Hey, Jared. How's it going, Sharon? Doing good. And we also have um, another Tom's Hardware senior editor, Andrew Friedman, joining us. Hey, Andrew. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me. Of course. So this week at Tom'sHardware.com, a lot of us have been, we're very busy testing a bunch of RTX 30 series gaming laptops debuting this week um, from Alienware, Gigabyte, Asus. Um, but the one Andrew tested, the Asus ROG Flow X13, is pretty unique. Uh, can you tell us about it, Andrew? Sure. So um, Ooh, there it is. this is it. Um, this is the Flow. And oh, it's, it, it's getting a little fingerprinty, but that's OK. I can wipe that off later. <laughs> and this is a ROG branded, so gaming branded, two in one. So it flips around into a tablet which isn't so much unique on its own as much as you don't see those gaming branded basically ever. There's really not too many of those because I guess, why would you? And as a, it wants my pen, as a laptop like this, it's, you know, it's what's special about it actually isn't the graphics card. That's a GTX 1650 Max-Q, but this is the first laptop we've tested with Cezanne. Um, so the AMD, Ryzen 5000 series. So this one has the AMD Ryzen 9 5980 HS. So the top end, super thin one. And it does really well on multi-core performance. On single core performance, still a bit behind Intel in some places. And the battery life was okay. Not as great as what we saw on the Zephyrus G14 last year on the 4900 HS. But, so, but I do like this laptop in that it's really nice and thin fairly light considering the fact that it has the GPU. Um, the keyboard's real nice. It has a it has a 1.7 millimeters of travel. You get this 16 by 10 display, which is a little taller than you might expect on a gaming notebook. And it provides, you know, it provides more workspace because you have more pixels going vertically. Um, the, even the port selection is fairly okay. It's got USB type C and A. But what you might find weird on it is that there's this port here which is for XG Mobile, and that is ASUS's proprietary graphics amp slash dock slash power connector. So it's this little kickstand here, so you could stand it on your desk, kind of stands at an angle. Um, on the back, there's a SOA port, so you've got your HDMI, you have your display port, you have a few USB ports and Ethernet. And then here, and I don't have it here because it's just kind of dangly, but you have a power supply. It's a 280-watt power supply. And there's also an SD card reader here up top. And then inside is the new RTX 3080. And that goes over this proprietary connector, this little chunker, instead of Thunderbolt 3, which Seuss was claiming would basically prevent you from squeezing any performance with Thunderbolt 3. It would just work expertly. And so this, this is big, this connector. I just want to like point that out. Like, here it is. Here's a YubiKey, right? Like it's, or like I have, some, I have some AirPods Pros in, right? Here's the case. Like it's very large. The, the cable actually feels pretty sturdy, but like it is connected directly in here. So I'm a little worried that at one point, like this will break and then we'll have a problem. But that just connects into that port there, and then you have a gaming laptop. So the idea is you take this one on the go. Then you go in there and you get RTX 3080 performance. It wasn't necessarily always the case that we got it. In some games, it was fine. In some games, it was a little less than the other laptops we tested with RTX 3070s or RTX 3080s in them. But these are using PCI uh, 8 PCI 3.0 lanes and USB Type-C right here to connect. So that's what makes it different than a lot of the graphics stocks you see. 
The other thing being that this is a mobile graphic stock. It's real light, it's fairly small, it's like the size of a paperback. And it's mobile RTX 3080. And so you can't replace it. This is always what it's going to be. So it's a, it's a it's kind of a weird device. Like I like this part on its own enough. The other, this one for some people is going to be really great, but you know it adds a lot to the price. I don't know why you would need the 3080 and the 1650 unless you expect to be doing something on the go that Vega couldn't handle. But the big issue I think for a lot of people right now with this, besides the fact that it's seemingly like out of stock everywhere, is that you can only buy them as a bundle. So Asus has told me that they're going to sell these separately at some point, but they're not telling prices. So you have this one right here with the 5980 HS and 32 gigabytes of RAM plus the RTX 3080, $3,300, which you know Ooh. is a whole lot of money. And then you can also, if you get the spec down version, that's the 5900 HS, which is nothing to sneeze at, and uh, 16 gigabytes of RAM, that's 3000 So like that 3000 is the minimum price for this thing. Wow. So you you touched on it a little bit. So how does and I think this is kind of what um, Salsa is asking. How does the performance compare with the 3080 in the eGPU compared to if it was actually in the laptop? Sure. So the the interesting thing about it is that it kind of tended to vary game per game, but I'd say on the whole, it tended to favor connections that you had when the GPU was in the laptop. So for instance, there were we tested the Alienware 15 M4, which has an RTX 3070 in it. And there were a number of games where that 3070, by I guess by virtue of being directly connected, outperformed this one with a 3080. So and there are a number of other RTX reasons that could be happening, including clock speeds and things like that. It kind of suggested that this thing is not that this thing is not necessarily giving you full power over this connector, but it seems to come closer than Thunderbolt does. So, um, Jared, I wanted to ask you. So, without the eGPU, this laptop has um, a GTX 1650 um, integrated. So that's obviously a couple of generations old at this point. So what sort of well, one generation kind of it's Turing still. It's like okay. Step. Okay. Fair. Um, so what sort of workloads would you say that card is, um, you know, still appropriate for? I mean, like 1650 is not a bad GPU for gaming. Like you just have to keep your expectations in check. Like you're not going to be playing 4K maximum quality or anything like that. But for a lot of games, uh, lighter, lighter fare especially, it should be fine, especially for like 1080p, anywhere from medium to ultra, depending on the game. So, you know, it's it's what I, I guess the 1650 is probably around the same performance as a 1060 um, and it's less power. Like I, I would assume in a max Q variant, that's probably only like a 40 or 50 watt chip, which is, you know, that helps with portability. Like Andrew was saying though, it's still kind of weird that they, they've got the Vega integrated in the Cezanne chip, but they're not using it. Instead giving you effectively two dedicated GPUs, which doing then the graphics switching and having to determine like, is the dock present? Are we sending the stream out there, I, I imagine that's impacting performance some, and it's, I don't know, it's a little clunky, I think. I, the way I'm, that works is actually really interesting. I mean, first of all, like this thing is a power adapter. First of all, I forgot to show you the power adapter. This is the one that comes with it, right? 100 watt USB-C, works fine with the 1650. But, but this thing is actually, like, it's a kind of a clunky thing. So you squeeze these, there's a little lock here. I'm not sure you're gonna be able to see it, but the, the black bars have these little balls. You squeeze this and you put it in, and then it has, so it has software that activates and it says, hey, do you want to activate the XG Mobile? So you say yes. And then that fills up a little bar and it takes time and it switches over from the integrated graphics and the discrete 1650 over to this. And then if you pull this out without going through the reverse process, <laughs> it'll tell you like, that was a bad idea. And, w and if you reboot the laptop, it's going to ask you like, hey, you... Actually, no, if, if you shut it down and then pull it out and then you turn it on without putting it back in, it's going to be confused, which apparently has something to do with the way the computer sees sleep states. That's going to be like, you should plug this back in or risk losing some data. Do you accept that risk? And like, 
So like you always want to make sure that like you turn it off the same way you, you're going to turn it on. And then when you disconnect it or reconnect it, you waited the right amount of time. And in that way, it's kind of clunky. Do they have, I mean, like you said, uh, it's got a hundred and a hundred watt USB-C power brick. Um, the 100 watt is this little guy that comes in the box with the computer. But that's not enough for running the laptop with the XGM thing, right? No, so the XG Mobile comes with, and I don't have the cord. I, but it oh, it has a here. separate power cord. Okay. It's a, there's a separate power brick built in here for both the GPU and the dock and the laptop. Which, I th which And that's actually my favorite part about this is that I work with a dock connected to a monitor. Mm -hmm. with a laptop a lot of the time. I mean, like when you see my desktop's behind me, so here I have this laptop. And that's what this was to me. It's like, okay, I'm gonna go work over there for a while on this, 16, mm -hmm. on this thin two-in-one, and now I'm gonna come back and it's gonna charge and, and connect to all my stuff. But 3080 is just kind of gravy <laughs> there. Like, I think this is just gonna show <laughs> a lot of gamers. How, this is just gonna show a lot of gamers how cool docks can be. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dock that's a little more cumbersome to attach and reattach. It is, yeah. So what are our thoughts on eGPUs in general? I mean, I would rather have <laughs> a good GPU integrated because like just switching, it's it's a nice idea, but it's it's more cumbersome. And then you always have that question of like, well, do I want to bring the graphics card? Do I not want to bring the graphics card if it's external? There are benefits to battery life for sure. Like the 3080, I think the, the 3080 in that dock uh, before NVIDIA pulled the information from their drivers, Andrew showed me a screenshot that said it was the 150 watt total graphics power variant. I can so, confirm, Asus, Asus's Armory Crate does say, does have that and it does say it's 150 watts. Yeah, so that's, I mean, all on its own, like imagine a laptop or a notebook with 150 watt GPU, that requires a lot of cooling. And if it doesn't have sufficient cooling, it's gonna get really hot and that's no fun. And then you have more weight cause you have to, you know, cool it better. So I get the reason for moving it external, but at the same time, it's like, ah, oh, it's it's a pain to deal with. I'm, I'm uh, not a gamer on the go really, so, I'm, I'm kind of one of those where I'm like, you know what, just get a good desktop for gaming and then get a good laptop for not gaming and never the two shall meet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not really, right? But you can play a lot of games without a high-end gaming laptop. Uh, you know, you could play Hades from last year. That runs fine on, on most systems. But yeah, I'm just like, I, I want a laptop that's easier to port, port around. But if I were gaming on the go, I would be, I'd be more interested in having the integrated GPU, not integrated graphics, but a, a, a high-end GPU inside the system rather than external. So we have a question from Ted Cole, just looking for some clarification. So this will operate without the eGPU, correct? Is this why they call it a two-in-one? Uh, we can't hear you, Andrew. Sorry, I was muted. There you um, go. <laughs> here's a laptop operating without the eGPU, without the XG Mobile. That's over there somewhere. Wasn't even plugged in. Um, it's kind of... It would be cool if that was part of their two-in-one. Like if they wanted to call it a three-in-one, I'd almost see it. But <laughs> this class of computer, these convertibles that flip around, and now it serve now it serves it's serving as a tablet. I have hit a whole bunch of things to bring up the settings, but that's besides the point. So it is serving as a tablet now, and because it does that, it is a both tablet and laptop. That is a class that's often called a convertible two-in-one. And then there's the detachable two-in-ones like the Microsoft Surface. And have the keyboard come off and those are also two in ones but so that is really why they call it two in one because it does this laptop slash tablet combination so is there an obvious reason um because they could have made this laptop not have a discrete um graphics card and then you use the rtx 30 rtx card as the eGPU, and then that would have made the whole thing cheaper so is there a reason why they felt the need to include a gtx 1650 I mean, they are pushing this, uh, and they, it's funny because they've been pushing this for gaming, but they've also been pushing it creative. So my best guess would be that the 1650 is something that like, it provides a little extra graphics oomph if either you're gaming on the go, but also if you're working on the go, like if you're taking this and you're an artist and you're drawing somewhere or, you're using, or then you, you're using Photoshop or something like that, you have that extra oomph that you won't get from the integrated graphics. I would say that's 
probably my best my best guess again like i'm not in there asus my, it's funny because when jared was talking about the eGPU and he says oh we'll get a good laptop and get a good gaming laptop i mean i feel like the dream for the eGPU is that you do have something here like this that ultimately doesn't have any performance sacrifice right and then you could just buy one device it could be your nice laptop and then bring it home and maybe not gaming on the go you don't bring that on the go but you bring this home and then bam it's a gaming machine but in this case they're kind of saying like okay this will be a computer with some graphics power on the go and more graphics power at home and maybe they'll sell it without the dock at some point and then you know you you would probably be more inclined to say, hey, it's a nice high-end high end two-in-one, so you don't want to have it be. I'm, I'm curious what they would charge without the dock. I mean, a 3080 yeah, mobile so chip. Asus did, tell me, yeah. Asus did tell me it would be coming later this year on its own. They didn't say when later this year is, and they also declined to comment on what the cost is, which means I can't tell you like how much that the EPPU adds to the cost because I don't know. I can I'm tell guessing you like well over a 1000 <laughs> Well, we have a comment from Coral saying you can pre-order it in Germany for 1,500 euros without the eGPU, but that is with a lesser CPU than what you tested it with, right, Andrew? Because you had a yeah, that, was, there, that appears to be the 5800. Interesting, the 5800 HS isn't even available in the U.S. The 5900 seems to be the lowest one that they're currently selling in the United States. This one with the 5980. Asus is technically calling it the Supernova Edition, but it is interesting to see what the price might ultimately be. It'll probably be in the fifteen to two thousand dollar range before you get to the eGPU. Um, so, a couple questions from our viewers. Um, one from Coral: Did you get the chance to use the Asus Pen? Uh, you know, I noticed somebody was it had a question about that with a comment on the review that I didn't get to respond to yet. So, I guess this will be the response: No, I didn't get to use the Asus Pen. <laughs> Um, we got these pretty early, so there was, and the listing says it comes with a case and a pen. Ours came with neither. We just got the laptop and the GPU, so I can't speak to the pen as it will be for most people, unfortunately. But that's typically included in, in the box, the pen? At least, I mean, per ASUS's listing on their website, if you were to go to it does say that it comes with a laptop sleeve and the stylus, which I think for $3,000 you should throw in. Yeah, for sure. Um, and can you talk a little bit about the, perf the performance without the dock? Ted Cole is asking if it's at least decent. Well, you got a sure. pretty um, beefy CPU to start. Yeah, the CPU is is really good, especially for multi-core performance. So if you have a multi-core app, that's it's probably one of the best ones around for that. For single core, which is what a lot of gaming still is, it wasn't always, it was usually around where Intel currently is, but it's a pretty beefy CPU for CPU performance. And that's gonna be either with or without the GPU. The GPU, as Jerry kind of said earlier with the 1650, if you're gaming on this, then you are going to want to like sort of set your expectations. Our benchmarks are very like, what are the ideal you might want to set this game at? And it oftentimes didn't, it's not going to run your games at ultra at, on 4K. It might run your esports games great. If you're playing Rocket League or you're playing Overwatch or you're playing something like lower grade, like as Jared mentioned, Hades from last year, those will probably all run fine. And most games will probably run fine if you turn them down to like low and medium. You'll do really well, even high for some games, but just don't expect like the top of the top. The one thing I will say I've noticed is that the laptop gets hot when gaming or like when running it in general. And when you have the dock and you're using the 3080, all the heat is no longer over here. It's over here, at least for the GPU. So if you're using GPU intensive tasks and you don't want the heat, it's just all gonna come out over here, which is kind of neat. Otherwise, like this laptop, while super portable, will get really warm because it's so thin. So this is one thing to consider when you're using it is that it does get nice and steamy. Awesome. Well, thanks for the viewer questions we've got so far. Like I said, it's definitely a unique laptop to enter a lab. So if you have any more questions for Andrew, definitely drop them into the chat and we'll still try to get to them. Um, in the meantime, Hitman 3 is here, everybody. Uh, but we all know your experience will differ, of course, depending on the hardware you use to play the game. 
and Jared's been testing game performance on a bunch of graphics cards, comparing frame rates different res at different resolutions. Um, so Jared, one of the things I noticed looking at your results, um, obviously, is that the RX, AMD's RX 6900 XT consistently beat uh, NVIDIA's RTX 3090. So my first question for you is, what does that card have over the NVIDIA card? So it's, and I got into a discussion with this on in the comments on the article is like, well, how do you benchmark it? And there's multiple ways of doing that. So the game has um, two built-in benchmarks. It has Dartmoor, which is very heavy on physics and particles. And basically it's like going around the Dartmoor mansion with a machine gun shooting two streams, constantly blowing things apart. Um, so Sounds like know. fun. Yeah, and I'm like, for a stealth game, I don't think you're actually going to do a whole lot of dual machine guns, but I haven't played through it enough to say for hey, certain. You don't know how I play Hitman. That's right. That's right. Um, so, so then the other test was Dubai, which is like the first level of the Hitman 3 saga, um, and you're outside a skyscraper at the start of it. And so, like, neither one is the perfect representation of what the game will be throughout the game. And, and this goes for like, well, how do you benchmark it if you don't use those? Well, then you manually run some scripted path, but then that's not representative of every level of the game. So, you know, benchmarks can vary. I've seen other sites that did not use the built-in benchmarks and they don't show AMD as having an advantage. I don't know if that's uh, because of differences in testing, differences in levels, differences in other aspects of the hardware, you know, uh, Intel, it, this is an Intel promoted game, which is kind of interesting. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's more for the CPU side or future GPU side. Uh, they do kind of mention XE graphics in one of the, the IO interactive videos talking with Intel. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. Um, it's not like AMD promoted. So at least you can't say, well, IO Interactive got paid by AMD to make it run better on RX 6000. I I kind of ran out of time and I haven't gotten to the RX 5000 and other cards, but you know, it, it runs fine as the thing. This is not a game where I really feel you need, um, you know, 120 frames per, per second because there's a lot of just kind of walking around, blending in crowds, planning your assassinations and whatnot. So, you know, while it's nice to have a bit smoother experience, I don't think it's, it's like Doom Eternal or whatever where, oh yeah, 144 FPS on 144 hertz display is better than 60 FPS. But, I mean, it, it is what it is. Um, Actually, in terms Jared, can of, I ask you a quick question about yeah. that? Which is, I remember you said it's Intel promoted, but I remember like it was the day of AMD released an adrenaline driver for Hitman 3. Did NVIDIA ever release a game-ready driver? They have not made any comments about game ready for Hitman 3. Um, and I, I will say, I actually started testing AMD um, 6800, I think it was a 6800, with the previous, what is it, 20.12.1 driver. And like literally that same day, an hour in to my testing, they said, hey, there's a new driver coming out optimized for Hitman 3. And they said it would boost performance by 10%. I tested it on the 6800. I saw more like a three to five percent boost in performance. So, you know, it's not like their driver accounts for the 10 to 15 percent difference between AMD and NVIDIA. It's more architectural. This is a DirectX 12 game, which traditionally AMD has done better in DirectX 12 than NVIDIA. It's just kind of differences in their architecture um, and their driver philosophy. Hitman 2 was DirectX 12 after launch it, it wasn't at launch but same with hitman the previous one so they've had dx12 for a while i don't know if nvidia is just like eh, it's not that important or if they haven't felt the need to optimize or if they can't do much to optimize whatever it is like it it runs well enough now uh, i mean even on a 2060 um at 4k ultra settings it was getting 43 frames per second so i mean it's not 60 frames per second but 4K Ultra is not what you would normally play on a 2060 anyway. So um, I, I need to kind of get down into the, I haven't gotten to them, but I need to test like the GTX cards and the previous gen cards to see where exactly it lands there. But I, I would assume if you're looking at 1080p to 1440p, if you could play Hitman 2, you can probably play Hitman 3 just as well is kind of how it's looking. And, and there has been some graphical upgrades. Um, they're also talking about ray tracing 
um, coming in a future patch, which is, again, interesting because right now, Intel doesn't have any support for ray tracing, but it's supposed to come in the XEHPG, which <laughs> who knows when that's coming out. Uh, like there there was a tweet from Raja Kuderi, uh, the senior VP over like the graphics and compute and stuff for Intel. He used to be at AMD, um, if you don't know who Raja is, but he tweeted something basically to the to the effect of making a brand new GPU architecture is really hard. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, but I, I'm like, well, that doesn't imply that XEHPG is going to ship um, soon to me. So we'll we'll have to wait and see. I'm like, well, XEHPG is supposed to support ray tracing. Um, maybe they'll get the Hitman 3 ray tracing patch right when XEHPG comes out, or maybe it will come out sooner. I guess we'll wait and see. Um, yeah, so that's interesting um, in terms of the ray tracing. Do we have any idea, because there are different um, ways to implement ray tracing, and you could do have one type of ray tracing, right, or multiple types? Do we know yeah, what so they can are? do shadows. You can do things like shadows, ambient occlusion, reflections, global illumination, um, diffuse lighting, whatever you want to call these things. They haven't said, IO Interactive has not commented, like, hey, we're going to do ray trace shadows or ray trace reflections. Um, so one of the interesting things about Hitman 3, um, they did tweak the engine some. And uh, so reflections are really complex normally because how do you re accurately reflect like what's behind me off of my screen? Um, screen space reflections are what is used as the current hack workaround to fake reflections. And the idea being, if I'm looking forward and there's a puddle on the ground, and then I've got like stuff in the distance on the screen, you can kind of flip what you've rendered in the background and blur it and do some funky processing and make it look like an accurate reflection. But as soon as the stuff that you're reflecting is off the screen, screen space reflections don't work. Well, Hitman 3 has, I, I, I'm guessing they have certain surfaces that are defined as being a special reflection case and they actually do the reverse projection so it's like um from what i can tell anyway it looks like they're probably at a lower resolution lower quality rendering a second view of what the mirror would see so you know the mirror projected looking back at your face and then they render that in the lower quality and then they can draw that to the mirror and it looks like kind of like ray traced reflections uh you know and it's it's a it's a more computationally accurate way of doing reflections than screen space reflections. So they do have certain surfaces that do accurate reflections, including mirrors and the outside of the Dubai um, tower that you start in does those uh, accurate reflections. So I thought that was kind of interesting because I'm like, well, if they add ray tracing and they do reflections, how much of a difference will that really make? Will people be like, oh man, these reflections look so much better? Or will they just kind of go like, Eh, that's all right, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's the problem with ray tracing in general. Yeah, right now. I was gonna say that's often. It's, <laughs> it's, it's like, can you make it look so much better that people go, "Oh man, I have to have that." Like, there's, I would say, Control and Cyberpunk are the only games where you could actually really make a good argument that ray tracing changes the look enough that it's worth doing. But even then. If you didn't have ray tracing on, you would be able to play the game and be quite happy with the, the experience. And then if you saw it with ray tracing, you're like, oh, that looks better. OK, but it's not yeah. it's not game changing. I finally got to get heavily into control um, <laughs> last week and I was playing it. and I was like, wow, this game's sick. And then I turned on ray tracing and I'm like, oh, it's like a little bit sicker. <laughs> but um, Andrew, what's what's your take? How do you feel when you hear games getting ray tracing? Does that appeal to you? Does that make you want it more? What's your take? I mean, I always like to try it because I think it's really interesting to see how developers are implementing it. I um, I haven't played a ton of Cyberpunk, but I did play Control. I, lo I love Control. Control is one of my favorite games of the last few years. And that one, I remember when I first saw it at like at an E3 and a short bit of the time to change it instantly. And that was the first time, I was like, whoa, like there's some, there's really some there there. And that one still to me really stands out. Of course, I also took a huge performance hit when I decided to play it at home that way. <laughs> so, but for me, the that game was so much about atmosphere that I was willing to do it. 
for other games, it sort of depends. So I, I like to see the creative ways in which it's implemented when they when they decide to do it. But it's not like a must have for me in every single game. Um, so Jared, are you done with your Hitman three benchmarking, or will you be doing more? <laughs> I got sidetracked. Um, I, I've, <laughs> I've got other things I'm working on. I've got graphics cards um, that you can't buy that uh, that I am trying to get reviews posted of. So it's like I've got a, another 3080 card that I'm working on writing the review right now, and instead I'm on the show. <laughs> Thanks, Jared. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's 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 really hard to write reviews for cards that kind of can't be bought. Like it's not just a launch article. This is like we're now four months, five months almost since the uh, 3080 launch, and like you still can't find them in stock anywhere at close to MSRP. And you know, we I think there was an article that we had or someone else wrote up that said. Over 50,000 Ampere GPUs have been sold on eBay via like scalpers or secondhand market. You know, it's stuff like that where you're like, okay, 50,000 is not like a massive number for total GPUs, but that's a lot of GPUs sold on eBay for a brand new card. And that's, that's uh, not a nice thing to see, but you know, until the situation improves and it's not just GPUs, it's everything like there's substrates that are used in your printed circuit boards are delayed in shipping there's you know memory components are delayed and all these things are kind of just on one on top of the other all these delays have come because of covid and other factors and so uh yeah i don't know when we're going to see normal gpu prices again which is sad i mean we've we've been sitting on uh turing rtx 20 series for over two years now and the new hotness the sequel has come out and amd has done the same they've got their new stuff and you can't buy them and it's like oh well uh i guess you just keep using what you had jared i think you should get to go on vacation until these new cards are in stock i i agree that's a good idea like <laughs> it's funny because i one of the manufacturers kind of like hey when are you going to get that review posted and i i'm like kind of rolling my eyes internally i'm like <laughs> i want to respond and say well I'll write a review when the cards are actually available for purchase because right now the reviews are all like, look, if you can find one of these unicorns out in the wild, you should buy it if, if you've got the money, um, which, you know, that's, that's the other problem is um, even at retail outlets, I think they're now being marked up several hundred dollars over their launch prices. And they're saying, oh, well, it's partly because of tariffs and stuff, but you know, it's really about supply and demand. What do you think is going to happen with the laptop GPUs now that they're here? So obviously the RTXs are here. I, I looked. I just pulled up a few of them that we reviewed. Several of them are like launching this week, so maybe they're still not there. Or they're launching next week. The Alienware M15 R4, to Dell's credit, is on its website and for sale. But I'm really curious to see if, like, well, people can't get these RTXs for their desktops. Are they going to go for the laptops? Or well, and let's let's be frank laptops are more lucrative like bottom line and and let's also we we could have talked about this earlier but this is important an rtx 3080 in a laptop is not an rtx 3080 in a desktop in fact it's really a 3070 it's the gp 104 chip it's got two more um streaming multiprocessors so it's got 48 instead of 46 but clocks are probably a bit lower so it's not going to be you know, really faster than a 3070 desktop. And then on the memory side, they're eight gigabyte cards, right? The ones that you've had, or are they 16? They're eight, or at least the yeah. one I tested. Yeah, it's a, they depend. I don't remember off the top of my head the 3080 I had. I'll have to open that up and check it. But yeah, yeah. They, they also, there's several different SKUs of them. <laughs> there's a lot of SKUs. So uh, <laughs> um, you've got, you've basically got a 3070 in a laptop, which is, nominally a $500 graphics card if you want to uh, if you want to go buy what Nvidia launched them at but realistically it's going for $700 or more actually it's it's sold out and you find them for $1000 on eBay but you know the the MSRP's on Asus and Gigabyte and stuff cards seem to be trending closer to that like $600 $700 range um 
you stick that same chip in a laptop, you can probably sell it for a thousand dollar or a twelve hundred dollar markup, which is why, you know, this this flow was a thirty three hundred dollar laptop. It's like, man, that is super expensive. That is a really, really nice desktop system for thirty three hundred. Oh, it's also got two GPUs and I'm sure they're paying some <clears throat> RNG for the after. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, the thirty eighty mobile isn't going to take away chips that use that were going to be a 3080 desktop right but um and i've talked about this in articles you know nvidia and amd have to decide months in advance what kind of gpus do we want and so you know you've got these silicon wafers and you decide is it going to be a ga 102 is it going to be a ga 104 is it going to be a ga 106 or on amd side is it going to be navi 21 is it going to be a uh, ryzen cpu like what are you going to use this wafer for and uh, they decided that probably six months ago. And so, you know, 3070 chips that might have been going to desktops could now be used in a laptop, but all the 3080 and 3090 chips are still whatever, you know, Nvidia ordered. And clearly they either didn't order enough or couldn't order enough to meet the demand. And the word now is like, eh, it'll probably be second half of 2021 before we catch up to demand. And I'm not confident on that estimation either. Yeah, it's kind of hard to wait around till <clears throat> maybe the second half when you see laptops, if that's doable for you, available, wanting your money right now. So yeah, a gaming laptop's not a terrible idea. I mean, and this is one of the other things you have to look at is how much performance do you really get? Like if you've got a desktop with like a 2080, it's probably not really much slower than a laptop with a 3070. Um, so keep that in mind. But it is more portable if you get the laptop. <laughs> um, well, yes. Yeah, so um, we have um, Jared obviously is here. He's our graphics expert. If you have any questions for him, either on really anything graphics or also his Hitman 3 testing, definitely drop it into the chat and we'll try to get into it. It looks like we already have a few viewer questions that we can go through. But I first want to give a shout out to Rafael Canelo. Um, one for saying hello from Mexico City and for letting me practice my Spanish. So. Thank you. Um, I don't speak Spanish. I hope he said something nice to us. Yeah, he said hello, Jared. <laughs> yeah. from City. Um, and Andrew and Sharon, greetings and hugs. I'm thinking hugs because best Bezos is kisses. Uh, <laughs> but this is not a Spanish lesson, and it wouldn't be given by me if it were. Um, but we have some Please questions <laughs> on the flow. So let's take a look. Um, one from Thomas Hinton, Hinterreather Kern. Uh, I apologize if I said that wrong, but hey, Thomas. Um, is resizable bar support already enabled on this sample? I'm guessing they're referring to the Flow, the ASUS yeah. Flow laptop. Yeah, we, we have not been able to play with the resizable bar ones yet, including here. That, I think they can do that with the software update, but it is not yet in here. You can go in and check in the NVIDIA system information and it's a no. And we have an qu interesting question from CSAIL. Have you, have you tested the XG Mobile with an external monitor? Unlike other gaming laptop competitors, this laptop's monitor is 16 by 10 aspect ratio, which Andrew mentioned, and it's not directly connected to the eGPU. So, but before you answer that, Andrew, can you buy the dock separately? Um, yeah, at the moment, you cannot buy it separately. These come in a bundle. At least in, at least in the U.S., they're coming in a bundle, which means like you got to buy them together. Period. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, as for the the question, mm -hmm. so yeah, this will come of it. We ha we haven't really done a lot of testing with. We haven't really done a whole ton of testing with an external monitor. Typically, we've been we've been doing testing on the laptops. We do them on the laptop screen that it comes with. And that's often because that's how we tend to believe people use the gaming laptops on that display. To be fair, this dock does have the outputs. The outputs are not on the laptop itself. You have your display port and HDMI right here. Um, but that might be an interesting thing to go back and do if we find some time. Um, it is 16 by 10. Again, like I said, I'm a fan of 16 by 10 for most things because 
you get a little more vertical space. And obviously that is more pixels to push. Um, you could turn things down to 1080 in most games if you want, if you're willing to deal with some black bars. Um, for me, I'm willing to take a little bit of a hit. I didn't see a huge difference over 1080 by doing it with the, with the black bars. I'm sorry, or with doing it in 16 by 10. But we have not done a lot of testing with the external monitor. It's interesting to hear that there's a lot of interest for it there. Yeah, that's why I asked my first question because I was thinking because um, you'll always be using it with the laptop, but I guess you don't necessarily have to be using it with the 16 by 10 screen. Yeah, yeah I mean, like if you're using the laptop screen, like this would this would impact performance because it's got to send, like the the laptop would normally send the the data out to the to the graphics card from the CPU and system to do the rendering, and then the GPU just spits it out to the screen. But in this case, it has to then send that data back over the PCI Express link, which is right. uh, only an, a by eight Gen three. Which I mean, it's it's fast enough for general use, but when you're sending screen data like this. I'm sure it's it's got to be at least a, a five to ten percent impact, and it's probably more in some cases. I, I think it would probably cap your frame rate too. Like, uh, you know, you're not going to do 360 frames per second because it would too, it would use up too much bandwidth. Um, so we have another question from C Sale on the RAM: Is the LPDDR4X RAM quad channel or dual channel? Pop quiz, Andrew. I you believe, know that off the top of your head? Yeah. It's got to be I dual believe, channel. Yeah, we say I believe it to be dual channel. We really haven't seen quad channel in gaming laptops at all. But if, if you're okay. interested, I can put on. And actually, it's also soldered to the motherboard like entirely. But if you're interested, real quick, I can stick on. There we go. So like, that's what it looks like inside if you want to have the RAM. And those small black bars under the cooler are the RAM. It's totally soldered. And I believe it's just running in dual channel entirely, but you couldn't take it out anyway. Just what's there is there. Our version came with 32 gigabytes, but there's also a gigabyte version. Yeah, I think the only quad channel options that are available are either Intel's X, uh, LGA 2066 or um, the Threadripper stuff from AMD. Like, no, my knowledge has ever on a quad channel laptop that wasn't using one of those HEDT systems in a notebook. And a fun fact, um, at Tom's Hardware, if we ever get a laptop that we can open, we do. So you can always check out the internal design of the laptops we review on the website, assuming they're upgradable, assuming they let us open it, which is often usually the case with the gaming laptops. Yeah. Um, so you can it's upgrade like them and repair them and whatnot of the time. All righty. Um, oh, so we also have one more question from Nikhil S. Joseph. Do you know the wattage of the RTX 3080 eGPU dock? Um, somebody says it's 150 watts, but I don't know if they're correct or not. Uh, so if you're using this as a power supply for the, com for the computer, then it's a 280 watt power supply. Um, unless they mean what is the wattage of the PS of the power supply in there, which um, in which case is oh, what did I say it was? In which case I believe is a hun is 150 watts. So per um, per armor crate. So if you're talking about it as a power supply, it's 280 watts. If you're talking about the RTX card inside, it goes up to about 150 watts. It's really interesting. We're getting a lot of. Um... Ever since we started covering the flow, we've been getting a lot of interesting questions on it, which is kind of like surprising to me. I just didn't really see the immediate audience for it, but there seems to be a lot of at least interest in it. I don't know if it's gonna sell, but people are curious. Um, so it looks like we've gone through um, our questions. So I just wanna take a second to thank everyone who's been watching. Um, if you've had fun, please show us some love by liking Tom's Hardware on Facebook, liking this video on YouTube, subscribing to our YouTube channel. So many great things you could do. Um, you could also download each episode of the show as a podcast. Um, so take a look at that if you are interested in taking us with you uh, via audio. 
And so I just want to thank Andrew Friedman and Jared Walton, Tom's Hardware Senior Editors, so much for stopping by. Um, that is our show. We'll see you next Thursday. Okay. Thank you.